Hereby, I open this academic ceremony in which Daniel Ferreira Batista will defend uh, the academic thesis, uh, <clears throat> breathing life into in vitro models, exploring the respiratory, respiratory landscape of bio-inspired culture substrates for pulmonary research. <coughs> May I invite you to present a summary of your study and the conclusion of your thesis? Dear Prorector, members of the Corona, family, friends, and colleagues, I will now start my presentation. I would like to start by stating that I truly believe that bioengineering is a form of art where curiosity and creativity converge in the quest to understand and represent reality in vitro. And depending on the methodology, the techniques, the approach, the results can be dramatically different. So today, I will share with you my representation of reality applied to the lung field. I focus my PhD on the lungs, and they are a vital organ for our existence, but also a primary organ of the respiratory system. And they, they allow us to breathe, they are responsible for gas exchange, and despite this intricate configuration, they actually, actually constitute a direct path between the interior of our bodies and the external world, making them highly susceptible to external virus, pollutants, smoke, and particles. And this, in part, relates to the fact that lung-related diseases are still the third leading cause of death globally, which poses a huge burden on our society and economy, and this needs to be addressed. So for quite some years, uh, many funds and efforts have been directed towards advancing lung research, but also towards the development of better, of better research tools. And this is where I focus my research. Now, if we go into the lab and we realize how currently lung research is being conducted, we can see there's a huge disparity between the realism of the native structure and the simplicity of the model. We are not mimicking the full complexity. It's almost like we have a flattened version of this organ. We are not recap recapitulating the physiology. We are not preserving the microanatomical features, such as the curvature, where I focus my PhD on. So we started this journey by trying to understand why curvature being present in our lungs, but also in many other organs, was not being replicated in vitro. And for a while, we understand that we didn't have the right tools, the technology. We couldn't really create this curvature at a scale that cells could sense. However, since the advent of technology, many tools became available outside the clean room which made them more accessible and cheaper. And this enabled the more systematic and precise and even higher throughput study of curvature. So the initial steps were already taken a long time ago, but they mainly focused on single cells, not really the tissue perspective. And this tissue perspective is highly important when engineering naturally curved membranes, such as the lungs, but also the kidneys and the intestine. So we started the work and we focused on incorporating this curvature in our models. So in chapter three, what we did was to create a 3D alveolar model based on biomimetically cur curved membranes. The idea was to look at the functional unit of the lung, the alveolar sac, open up this structure, and try to simplify it in the lab. Our approach was to create this microthermoform membrane, which pockets resemble these pockets of our alveoli. And with this membrane, we could culture our cells inside and try to replicate this alveolar epithelium. So that's what we did. We started by culturing different cell types, and we realized from the very beginning that epithelialization is a highly cell type pro uh, dependent process, meaning that for each of these cell types, we had to tweak the initial parameters. We had to play with the densities. But after a while, after all the optimization, we established these curved epithelial layers where we could investigate readouts such as aerial density, cell shape, cell neighbors, cell size, morphology, the monolayer thickness, and even proliferation and apoptosis. Then we took the next step and we showed the compatibility of the system with air liquid interface. And this is a commonly used technique in the lung field to differentiate cells. In order to do it, you have to remove the medium from the top compartments, and we let these cells be exposed to air. We did it for three weeks, and afterwards, we investigated monolayer thickness, 
on both types of membranes, permeability across the layer, um, EMT, so epithelial to mesenchymal transition, and some differentiation markers such as mucin for mucus producing cells. Then we entered in chapter four, where we took this previously established membrane and we apply it on chip. We move from a static system into a perfused one, increasing realism. And on top of having this curvature, now we have a perfused system, but also we incorporated endothelial cells. And we did it by creating this microfluidic device that consists of two parts of PDMS where we can integrate our membrane in between. By doing this, we create this air compartment and the bottom one that we called medium compartment. In this air compartment, we culture epithelial cells and on the other side, we culture endothelial cells. And by doing this, we establish this pseudo alveolar capillary barrier on chip, but here focusing on the multi alveolar perspective. We are not just focusing on this interface, we are focusing on the alveolar sac. So with this model, we followed the stepwise approach. We started on the air compartment by culturing these epithelial cells. And the process was not trivial because we have to see them by infusion, meaning that we had cells from one side of the chip and we let them cover the surface. And we didn't see any signs of clumping, which is great. And we could even notice uh, tight junctions forming on these served, curved surfaces. We did it submerged for seven days and then exposed for 14 days. And here again, we show the compatibility with the air liquid interface technique. Now with this system, we investigated readouts for differentiation such as acoporin and surfactant protein C and also EMT. So then the next step was the inclusion of these endothelial cells that we did also by infusion. And we established this co-culture on curved membranes on chip. We had it stable for 11 days and at the end of these 11 days, we could still see this confluent monolayer formed on the epithelial side and this pseudo network of microvascular endothelial cells on the other side. And actually, these kind, re, kind of repre, represent the alveolar septum we have in our body in between the, the alveoli. So then we move into chapter five, where we shifted the focus from the alveolar sac towards the small airways. And here, what we did was to focus on restoring curvature at multiple scales. So we didn't just represent one structure, we did it for four, four of them. And the approach was the same. We tried to simplify the organ and represent it and translate it into a microthermoform membrane. And here perhaps you can appreciate the half bigger tubes and also the <coughs> bifurcated ones. In order to, to establish this, we had to culture bronchial cells on these membranes. And we did it for 15 days. We let them populate and really experience the surface. And by the end of these 15 days, we saw these beautifully curved shapes on the differently shaped half tubes. Now with this system, we investigated cell morphology, cell size, and cell jamming. And jamming is a really interesting concept where we study this collective of cells as if they were fluids, moving more in a fluid way or more towards a solid-like state. We took the next step and we exposed them to air. Again, showing the compatibility with the air liquid interface for 14 days, but also investigating differentiation markers such as mucin here for mucus producing cells and also tubulin for ciliated cells. And we also checked jamming now in this matured epithelium. Finally, we transitioned into chapter six, which is different from all the previous ones, because here we took our expertise in creating culture platforms and we applied it to organoids. And for the ones who don't know organoids, they are these 3D structures that derive from stem cells and self-organize. And they are the current hallmark for functionality in vitro. We have all the right cells that we wish to have in the model. However, the traditional approach of culturing these systems is with the, mat with the matrigel drop. And this is almost like a jelly substance where we have all these organoids inside. And this is great for their development, but not the best when you want to observe, when you want to study them. Because we have organoids everywhere, and then you have mixed signals. It's really difficult, or impossible actually, to have them all focused at the same time. So to address this issue, we created a microwell array where we could culture our organoids. 
And from the very beginning, we could see improved addressability because now we have a coordinated system with fixed positions. We have these organoids uh, occupying these cavities and staying there. We can monitor them over time. We have improved accessibility because the system is open. We can access it. We can pick and choose these organoids. And finally, but not less important, we have improved observability because we have them all in one focal plane and also, this is an optically transparent material which, ma which makes this platform compatible with imaging techniques, and that we'll see later. So with this system, with this platform, now we could investigate how these organoids are growing, how these organoids are polarizing. And in terms of growth, we could see them growing bigger, growing faster, and even fusing with each other and, f and forming these single luminized structures. We could see them polarizing and um, creating these ciliated cells pointing the, to, towards the inside of these lumens and beating and swirling all the luminal contents, as you can see here in this video. And this is an indication of functionality. Finally, we show the compatibility with immunofluorescent imaging. And here we did it with confocal imaging. And not only we stain them directly there, but we also image directly there. And you can see the organoids and all the right cells, but you don't see the microwells. So with this setup, we investigated proliferation, and we also checked differentiation markers for all the different subpopulation types. Here with the ciliated cells, with club cells, with mucus-producing cells, and even the basal cells. So we reached the end of my presentation, and I'd like to say that we created different approaches to increase realism and relevance in lung models. We created differently curved membranes for alveolar, but also bronchial applications. And we established the co-culture in biomimetically curved perfused systems. And finally, we created a culture platform for self-organized systems. And for the future, one can only hope that these models serve as inspiration for the innovative bio-inspired lung platforms, and that these platforms serve as the foundation for future developments of physiologically relevant alveolar and bronchial units for lung research. With this, I conclude. I would like to thank everyone involved, from supervision to execution, all of you from attending, for attending, and I give the word back to the prorector. Thank you. Thank you for your presentation. Are you ready to start? Mm -hmm. The opposition will be then opened by <clears throat> Professor Martijn van Griesven, who has been also the chair of the assessment committee. Professor Van Griezmann is uh, Chair uh, of Regenerative Medicine at uh, the Merlin Institute for Technology-Inspired Regenerative Medicine at uh, our university. Thank you very much, Pro Rector. Dear candidate, it was a pleasure to read your book. It was really a very nice work, and you also presented that here in such a way. Also, the supervisory team, of course, congratulations to that. The acknowledgments were in rhyme. I found that very fine. Asking questions is really hard. Therefore, I will leave the rhyming part. And I go to chapter five with you. You want to make a, a model of bronchioles. Um, the cells you are using, however, are bronchus epithelial cells. Isn't that a discrepancy? Highly esteemed opponent, thank you so much for your kind words and your poetry. And I would like to say that indeed, but I think this, is what, this actually was a common factor during the entire PhD and my research, because we can always advance the technology, but we can always validate it if we have the right cells. And indeed, we have this attempt to create a bronchiole, but we only had bronchial cells available to do so. So in a perspective of validating the system, the platform, we thought it would be um, okay, it would be acceptable. Of course, if we want to take it to the next level, we should focus on the right cells with the right components. But I also have to say that these cells, they do express uh, similar features, right? We could still preserve this mucus-producing cell to a certain extent, and also the ciliated cells. So I think in, in, within the limitations, I think it's still valid for a validation. Of Although bronchiolites do not really have the cilia, right? Exactly. Yeah. So if you notice, we also covered multiple structures of these small areas, right? We have the bigger 
portions that should mimic these terminal bronchioles where we can have some traces of the ciliated cells. And then as we go down in the airway, we, st we stop losing this and it becomes more mm -hmm. similar to the alveoli. Right. And then when you look on, on page 140, you have very nice pictures of, uh, of the microtubules, the actin, etc. Um, the, these microtubules, I, I couldn't see in your pictures, if it, are they really the ones that are making the microtubules in your cells? Uh, can you repeat, sorry? So the microtubules, you, you shown very nicely. Are that the ones that making the cilia in your cells? Well, I think so, but I can't really prove because we didn't check it. Mm -hmm. But in theory, it should be the precursor for. Mm -hmm. Okay, so that, then continuing. So what you, you already mentioned a little bit, there are also other cells uh, in there. Um, um, you have mucus cells, producing cells, uh, but you know also the bronchioli have more the clara cells, whereas the bronchi have more the goblet cells. Uh, did you check further your mucus producing cells? What type of physiologic cell is that? No, unfortunately we didn't have the opportunity to do it, but indeed it's a very good comment mm -hmm. and should be d done in the future. And do you think you would add those cells or are the cells that you have there um, differentiated by themselves just by your curvature? Well, I don't believe the curvature necessarily will make them differentiate, right? Because they have been used in other models and they have been differentiating. I think it's also a limitation of the technology itself. I think it's something that goes across the, the entire field. We always have this trade-off between expansion and differentiation. If we want something that expands, a cell type, cell line that expands, we'll lose some of this difference, differentiation potential. Mm -hmm. So it's really hard actually to combine both in a simple system as this. So many, many techniques or many approaches have been tested trying to tweak the medium, add supplements to really push these cells to differentiate, but also to keep the proliferation ongoing. Otherwise, after a while, all these cells start dying and we lose the, the, the model. Mm -hmm. And when they produce mucus, would that be a problem for your medium air interface? No, actually that would be advantages because this is what we have and this is what we want to have. So this gas exchange and also the collection of the particles specifically for the bronchioles should be at this, this layer. What we couldn't really identify is that we have a proper layer on top of these cells mm -hmm. because the markers, they were a bit diffuse and also the expression. But I think this actually would be an added value to the system itself. Mm -hmm. And then when you go to page 143, um, you show there very nicely the tube and you made all the, uh, yeah, all the foldings. Um, however, your tube, I think, is quite static. Yes. Whereas when you look at a, a bronchus or a bronchioli, uh, that villi are moving. Uh, they are also always changing. They are getting bigger, smaller, especially also the microtubules move. Um, how do you think that this difference between the, the, yeah, the flexible, moving, um, living uh, bronchus versus your static, I, I must say nicely folded, but how does it compare? Yeah, it's true. So in our system, we will always try to go in a simplified approach, right, to start with, because it has never been done before. So we started with this open system where we could try to see the cells. That was the first step, to see if they would actually attach to the surface and create these curved um, monolayers. Of course, if we want to go in this perspective of really m mimicking the, the, the structure, we should make it a tube and we should perfuse air. Because in fact, this air not only triggers the differentiation, but also keeps them happy and differentiated there. So I think one of the approaches that we suggest at the end is actually to roll them up. And if you can make them secure, and I think this is f fairly easy to do, we can still have these cells inside and actually perfuse air and trigger these cells to actually behave as the, the, the right epithelial cells mm -hmm. that we have in the bronchus. Now that you're just speaking like this, so you speak about the air on the one side, but on the other side you have normally, of course, blood, exactly. right? Uh, so how, how do you mimic that? And is your membrane yeah. also um, permeable for yeah. oxygen, nutrients, etc.? So these, these membranes, they are porous, mm -hmm. and we can tweak and, and control the pore size. So, and we have been showing this before, right? So, so for chapter three, where we have the on-chip, we also added these endothelial cells on the other side. So we could do exactly the same with this system, uh, perhaps not with microvascular cells, endothelial cells for this case, or we can try to go with a more uh, fancy approach if we have them rolled up as a tube and we can create 
potentially these also vessels surrounding the, the, mm. the bronchial tube, mm. I would say. But it shouldn't be difficult because we have done it, the material is the mm. same, so it's a matter of just optimizing a few parameters. Okay, thank you. Um, then we'd like to go to chapter six, which was also, also really nice with the, the organoids. Um, what I didn't completely get, so your organoid, you took it from lung tissue, from, from a cancer patient, so, um, so in your organoid, do you have only one type of cells, or is it like you took the lung and you yeah, just mixed it up in single cells and just put all the cells that were going out as an organoid? What, how did you do that? Well, so I didn't really establish these organoids <laughs> from scratch. I was given the opportunity to work with them. But these organoids, they contain all the right cells that we can capture in this, in this system, right? And we go from the single cells. Mm -hmm. When we, we suspend, they, they um, gather and start again the differentiation. This is something that we could actually monitor, right? Because it's not from the initial moment that we have ciliated cells. They need time to maturate within the self-assembled structure to get there. So it's not me tweaking the cells. It's us giving the opportunity mm -hmm. for these cells to get there. Yeah, and you, and you started actually with the droplet culture, right? Exactly. So, however, when I started reading your, this chapter, I was thinking, I was like, oh, uh, this droplet culture is always difficult, uh, and she's going now to come here with a nice micro well, and that is what's going, but that you only do afterwards. So why didn't you immediately start with the micro well culture? So I have to be honest, so we did start it, but we couldn't really achieve because in our case, what happened was when we go from single cells directly into these micro wells, they either float on top or they were sinking but not really finding each other. So we couldn't really optimize this protocol to start immediately on the micro wells, but this is exactly what we wanted mm -hmm. to do. And I think with some tweakments, perhaps with the, the supplements and the medium and how we incorporate the, the elements in the system, I think it should be achievable. Because we also, we see, it, we see it for other types of organoids. So I don't see an issue here. I think it's just a matter of having more time to actually optimize the conditions, the, perhaps tweak a bit the steps. I think it should get there. And do you think the cells, when you have them first in the droplet, makes a kind of a more, um, Imprinting? Short answer, please. Well, yes, mm. because you have all the right conditions and when you transition into the microwells, you kind of dilute a bit all the growth factors and the, the markers you have in this matrigel. So I think so. Mm -hmm. It's the prime vehicle to, to establish these organoids. Mm. Okay, thank you very much. I'm very happy with your questions and I give back to the pro-rector. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Van Griesven. Uh, uh, then uh, the opposition will be continued by Professor Elisabeth Rosado Balmayor who is professor in experimental uh, orthopedics and trauma surgery at the Department of <coughs> Orthopedic Trauma and Reconstructive Surgery at Aachen University Hospital. Thank you very much, Prorector. Dear candidate, I would like to start by congratulating you and the supervisory committee uh, for a fantastic thesis. It is very obvious that you have a very creative line and it's very nice and very pleasure to read your thesis. I would like to start by asking one of the paranymphs to read proposition number five. Highly esteemed opponent, thank you for your kind words and I'll give the floor to one of them. <clears throat> proposition number five. Formerly, progress in the organoid chip field was heavily dependent on the advent of the microbiofabrication. However, currently, it is being partially hindered by unanswered biological questions. Thank you. Thank you very much. So my question goes to why do you think that unanswered biological questions hinder the progress of organship? So, as I just mentioned before, in order to progress the technology, we need the right biology to go along with it. And from the very moment that we want to mimic what we have in our lungs, we need to be able to actually see how it is in our lungs. For the lungs, it's really hard to access, especially the, like the, the lower parts, right? So all the, the methods we currently have, they, in some way or another, distort a bit the, the structure. So we are, we are moving from a state where we assume that things are as we see them, but it's not 100% sure because we don't have the right tools to access and actually see how it should be. 
So just from this initial state, we are assuming something and we go along with this assumption. But for example, when we go with this curvature and we want to see if we have specific cells in specific regions, we don't have this information. So we are trying to prove or to show that curvature can have an impact, but we don't know exactly how it should be to compare it with. Also, in terms of, of biology, in terms of the cells available to get there, it also hinders a bit the progress because if we want to, to showcase a model with mucus producing cells, but your cells are not really differentiating or if they don't last, you'll never get there. So I think we really have to invest on developing more the technology to actually boost also the bioengineering of these models. Very good, but I understand from, from your answer very well that is, in, on the one hand, you have the technology limitations. There is a big limitation in terms of technology and tools that you need, right? And on the other hand, you have really the biology where the cells and the, the biological system perhaps are really not there. So it's, if I understand correctly, and progress on the biological field will indeed aid to organ on a chip to be more realistic. I think so. Very well. Um, another question then coming in similar lines. So if you consider your entire studies and the results that you obtain and the conclusion of your thesis, what is the translation of value of all your studies that you summarize here in this, in this dissertation? So I think if you check the cell as a whole, you will understand that it's a very exploratory process, right? So we started from scratch. Nothing was published before. So we didn't even know if it would be possible to have these cells attaching and, and, and staying on these curved surfaces. So we started from knowing that there was increased evidence that curvature influences cell behavior, but this was mainly done on single cells. And we go from a perspective of the tissue because we see it, therefore we want to mimic it. Um, but the reality is that we didn't conclude much, right? We only took this, the first steps in proving and establishing these, these platforms, which is already great because it's the initial step of the process, right? Of course, there are many things that we have to optimize and further explore because many things we couldn't really do due to the limitations of the system and readouts, for example, because if we think in terms of readouts, um, we have these cells lying these membranes but we have the curved surfaces, but also this flat in between. So if we want to go and explore protein level or gene mm -hmm. level, you have mixed signals. So you have to take a step further in manipulating your system in order to decouple these two to actually see only the effect of curvature. So there are many hurdles in actually getting to the answer to the essence of what curvature is doing in our models. I think the, the, the biggest value is that it looks promising, the cells stay there, and in opposition to many papers where we tested, for example, fibroblasts that just avoid completely the surface, I think there's potential to try to understand why. We also thought that at some point, these cells, they stay stable on these curved surfaces because they are meant to be there, because it's the right niche for them. But there's a lot to try to understand the whole composition of the work. But I think it's more inspiration and hopefully someone takes it over and further take, explores and tries to understand it. That's a very good point. Someone take it over. So um, you started from scratch, right? You did develop a complete model and there is a huge amount of work summarized in this thesis. And do you think this work is at the level that you in the future or someone that take it over could, for instance, test a um, drug or something for a, for a certain respiratory condition. Can, do you think that your mother could mimic a certain respiratory condition and then test, for instance, a therapy? I think it depends on the disease, the condition, and I think we have to, to, to make clear what we want to mimic there, right? So if we have all the right components of the pathophysiology, or the hallmarks of the disease, we can try to mimic them. Of course, for example, in a scenario of inflammation, maybe we don't have these cells uh, excreting cytokines, but we can add them. So we kind of fake this stimulation, but we have the effect. And that should suffice the, the process, right? We can always combine the multiple cell types. For example, we can add macrophages on the alveolar compartment, and then we can actually try to remove particles or 
even uh, pathogens. Uh, we can also incorporate, for example, neutrophils on these if we assume and we go, for, I think it would be better with the on-chip platform, right? On the bottom side, on the blood compartments, and then we can see them hopefully being recruited, trying to help with this harder situation. So I think yes, but we have to tweak it and really make use of the model, right? Because no model is perfect and we just need to know how to use it. Very good. Thank you. Um, and then we come back to the surfaces. And it's very clear when we study your thesis that uh, flat surfaces are not really good for achieving this type of functionality and subculture in cells. However, we keep subculture in cells in flat surfaces as a gold standard of cell culture. So I would like to debate a little bit with you whether you think that that is correct in general, whether you think that it should be adapted to the cell type and to the tissue type that you are studying. I mean, you are in a very broad institute. We have colleagues for different type of organs, different type of tissue. How would you see that perhaps the results of your thesis could impact the, the way we do cell culture today? Yeah, that's a very interesting point because we can look at curvature more as a tool to achieve something, right? It doesn't have to be just for mimicking these naturally curved environments. I can't really precise, but I know that in some, for some cells, you increase proliferation when we culture them on curved surfaces, and the same goes for apoptosis. So these, these surfaces, they can actually impact cell behavior. So I think if you know how it goes for each of these cell types, because it's highly cell type dependent, I think it would be worth to investigate what's the potential of using these curved surfaces as like the, or incorporate them, for example, in a flask, right, to really expand these cells and also to tweak the cell fate because some, each, uh, some papers, they also showed that some cells, they, they prefer and they, they go for one differentiation line in terms of, in, in regards to the whole spectrum, right? So we can actually see, but I think first you need to start testing. That's the most important because you don't know until you do it. Uh, but it, it could be a way to, to, to change, to tweak, to actually um, define what you have in culture if you use the curved surfaces, I would say. And then what do you think is more important, the geometry or the material properties? Hmm, that's an interesting point. I will say that in this case specifically, we have the geometry. And I say this because we always coated these surfaces. So the material mm. itself is just for support. And here we benefit from the optically transparency that's highly convenient. We have something sturdy that we can actually take and use and manipulate really easily. We have a material that, it's, that is actually, it has been used in the labs for decades, right? So it's highly compatible. So in this case, I would say that geometry is more important. Very good. And when you think about your curvature comparing to flat surfaces and the way the cells adhere and communicate with each other. So when you think at a single cell level, um, do you think your, the geometry will impact the gene expression at the single cell level, the capacity of produce cells, produce other, secrete other components? components that are important and how is that then to cell cell communication because obviously cells that communicate with each other in a curved surface have a completely different way of attaching to the surface so do you think that indeed impact and how would they impact the gene expression protein production I think so and we have papers uh, investigating this right so I didn't check it in my in my research but what I can say is that we know that curvature influences cell behavior. Usually, it's subcellular curvature, so it's more the topography, not really this type of curvature that we are representing here. I think it's still worth to investigate because also this curvature, we didn't really monitor or study, but we could see that you have different types of migration happening. We also have this initial state that it's, and it links to one of the propositions, it's already biased because when we see them, we kind of agglomerate the cells at the bottom. So we have a precondition in there. We have a confinement. So for sure, we'll have some sort of gradients being established, and that will uh, simulate and actually perhaps activate these cells in one way or the other. We have also this difference in curvature, right? Because we have this convex, and then we have an inflection point. 
And I cannot precise if the cells from the top go down or vice versa, right? But for sure, it will affect. And in terms of communication, for sure, because we have a collective of cells, right? It, it's not single cells, they are attached. We could see these tight junctions being formed. And in terms of, well, it, we, we didn't really explore it as much, but the few markers we, we investigated for differentiation, we could see some selection there. Might be an artifact to be investigated further, but I think there's something, and it could be, because we have a quite dynamic and diverse uh, uh, substrate. So I think so. Brilliant. Thank, Thank you very you. much for your answers. I'm very satisfied with the answers. I give the word to the prorector. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Rosadobal Mayor. Then we continue the uh, opposition with uh, Professor Andris van der Meer, who uh, joins us online. Uh, <coughs> professor van der Meer uh, is Professor in Microfluidic Organs and Chips uh, at the Department of Applied Stem Cell Technologies uh, of the Technical Medical Center of University of Twente. Thank you very much, Mr. Prorector. And uh, dear candidate, I too would like to congratulate you on completing this thesis. And of course, also congratulations to your promoter and co-promoter in uh, achieving that milestone. Um, I wanted to uh, discuss a bit with you multiple aspects of your thesis. And I would like to start with you maybe in chapter four. So particularly there's a figure in your chapter four, figure eight, uh, it's on page 107. And there, uh, in this chapter, of course, you set up in a microfluidic device, you set up co-cultures between epithelial cells and endothelial cells. And in this particular figure, in figure eight, you show also the results of the co-culture uh, that you have established there. And you already briefly mentioned it also in earlier in your defense, is that you, or at least I think in your presentation, you say that there's a very particular pattern here. So before going into the pattern of the endothelial cells, I was curious also about the staining that you used. So particularly in panel B, you use CD31 as a marker for the endothelial cells. Um, and I was a bit, yeah, interested, intrigued about the staining pattern there. I see a lot of intracellular staining, uh, whereas, yeah, that was not what I would have expected. Can you maybe comment on this? The opponent, thank you so much for your kind words. So regarding your question, it's true. So we do see this CD31 pretty much everywhere. But I will also point out to the fact that the signals are quite diffuse and we are trying to image a highly curved surface, right? So we always have to tweak the parameters to do so. So I wouldn't really pay too much attention to the intensity, for example, and the location at this level because we don't have enough um, accuracy. We don't have enough... Um, insights on exactly what's happening there. I think in order to make this type of judgments, we have to increase the resolution and go with a higher magnification to, to make this type of statements, I would say. Because we do see the granularity it, also sometimes from the material itself. So, yeah, it's a bit of a I limitation understand. of the... So have, have you... Yeah, I w I'm sorry to interrupt you, but I, I wonder, have you checked also the CD31 uh, pattern on the same cell type. So this is primary uh, long pulmonary microvascular, I think. Um, so have you checked also the PCAM1 or CD31 expression patterns on flat surfaces, for example? Uh, would you, because I would expect to see more cell-cell border staining here, adherence junction protein staining. So is that something that you uh, looked into or have you used these cells uh, exclusively here in the system? No, we did start with flats and we always try to monitor against the curvature. And we did there, we have more of this typical staining. I think it's unfortunate that that didn't include it, but indeed we could see it more around the, the cells and in between them. Oh, and I fully agree, of course. It's a difficult substrate to, to image through. And then, yeah, sometimes you just don't have the signal or the magnification to uh, really see the pattern. But that's more on the, let's say, single cell level or uh, subcellular level, of course. But the pattern you actually alluded to in your presentation earlier is the pattern you see here, which, yeah, basically ring-like structures of these endothelial cells um, yeah, at specific places of the, the micro-curved structures. So 
Can you comment a little bit? Because it's a very intriguing pattern. You call it in your presentation. Yeah, it seems like more a bit almost like a pseudo uh, capillary network or so. But can you maybe explain a bit more what yeah, what causes this pattern? And, you know, like the, the second I see it, I think, yeah, it could be the membrane, could be the coating, could be the, the mixed uh, co-culture medium, could be the perfusion or the low volume of the chip. or So, uh, yeah, immediately the mind boggles. Eh? Like, what would be the explanation here? Um, can you comment and maybe clarify a bit more? Yes, thank you for this question. This indeed is a very interesting topic because I must say that it happened, right? We didn't really... Um, we didn't really focus our efforts to achieve it. And for us, it was, we have to start from the very beginning, right? When we are seeding this side of the, the membrane, we flip it. And we, we see this by infusion, so we let these cells go and really explore and settle. So from the very moment we do this, most of these cells, they will land in between these cavities because we have a highly curved surfaces, surface. So in terms of gravity, it planes against having these cells on the top, on the apex of these, these cavities. Um, we also wondered, after this attachment, if we had some sort of shear that was just detaching these cells from the surface. But then with our uh, COMSOL simulations, we couldn't really see a shear that justified it, right? So we, we thought that if they work nicely in between these cavities where we have a flat, it must be the curvature that it's really triggering or challenging these cells to either climb up or stay there. Because we also couldn't really exclude if it's, well, in the beginning you do see some cells everywhere, but from the moment they start attaching, it's really hard to exclude or to, to choose if it's detachment or not being able to climb up and populate these apexes of the, of the, 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 the cavities. So this already at least makes it a little bit more clear. And I wonder, because it sounds quite plausible what you say, and like uh, indeed gravity is working towards, uh, yeah, seeding in between these ridges here. So is that something that you looked into a bit more systematically? Now, of course, it's a relatively complex system that you present here in figure eight. And so we see co-culture, it's in a chip, et cetera. But I can imagine that, yeah, you could look into the this mechanism or presumed mechanism that you now pose by, for example, just looking at isolated membranes that are not in a chip where you do different seeding or different ways of coating, et cetera, to sort of confirm that this is indeed like a, a an effect mostly of the curvature and the endothelial uh, behavior on those curved substrates. That's very true. And we did start... This, well, we start this, this work on a static system, right? So we do have this comparison without any perfusion, without all the, the hurdles of the, the chip, right? Because for the ones who work with it, we know that it's not the easiest. And we also saw it there. So on flat, oh, on flat, on curved static, we see the same. I think what we didn't really have is a day by day monitoring where we could actually see the cells detaching, the cells either climbing up or not climbing up. And I think that would be really interesting to take it and actually to do some real-time imaging to see how these cells populate or detach from the surfaces. Unfortunately, we didn't have the opportunity to do it, but I think it will be really valid. But also for the other side of the membrane, right? Because we say, especially for the static systems, that we add these cells and they fall by gravity. However, within the chip, we have the perfusion, we have this flow conducting and really spreading the cells uh, over the surface. So gravity is not really playing the role there. It's more a bit of uh, flow and then eventually they settle. Of course, we did it in a very slow approach to let them experience the full surface. And we could get a really nice coverage, right? We had cells everywhere, which was already a challenge from the very beginning. Because in perfused system, usually we have more cells from the closer to the inlet and less closer to the outlet. And we achieve with these slow flows to actually cover the entire surface on both sides. But I think to do a real-time monitoring of how these cells populate both sides of the cavity would be great insight into the system. We fully agree there. Yeah, very intriguing and like and definitely warrant some follow-up study there. I agree with you. I wanted to switch gears a bit and maybe discuss one of your propositions. So can I maybe ask one of your paronyms to read to us proposition number four? 
The bioengineering paradox. Aiming at creating realistic yet simple in vitro models, the increase in realism means an inherent increase in complexity which competes with the desired simplicity. Thank you. Thank you. So I, indeed, so I, I read the proposition and immediately it resonated with me and I felt like, oh yeah, so this is something I also thought about a lot, etc. And so I was already preparing maybe to discuss this a bit with you, particularly uh, a long time ago, yeah, about 10 years ago or so when I was uh, actively re uh, working on the field and, and uh, doing the first steps in, in organ on chip, I was also thinking about this aspect. And then uh, I kept reading your book and then also on page 192, so we're almost towards the end of the book there. So I think this was really smart of you to just at least include a quote uh, from one of my papers at the very end. So just to double check that I actually read the entire book. So rest assured I did. Um, but there on, on page 192, you say, as elegantly described, thanks, uh, by uh, Van der Meer and Van den Berg, um, we say, quote, paradoxically, the main advantage of in vitro model systems is also their main disadvantage. And the main advantage in this case being their simplicity is also the main disadvantage, obviously, because simplicity means that it's not realistic. So I too, indeed, I thought a lot about this aspect. And um, I think the key also in your proposition is this term of complexity, right? You say there's an increase in complexity and that is undesired because it, it competes with the desired simplicity. So maybe you can start by explaining a bit more to me, why is it so bad to have complexity or why is that so undesired? First, thank you for bringing this proposition because I really like it. So I think it's not, it's not that it's bad to have complexity. I think unfortunately we, not, we are not prepared to handle this complexity with the tools we have, with the knowledge we have. Of course, we want to have this, this complexity in the future because that also equals to realism. But we have to take a step-by-step -step approach and try to understand every single step because at, 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 if not, at the end, we just have a huge system or, well, a miniature, but huge in the sense that we have a lot of elements that we can't really explain and we don't know how they, they, they work, how they interfere one by one. And I think this is the step towards complexity, towards realism. Because now, just, just by simply adding curvature, I saw so many things that still need to be explored, right? So one step that I consider simple, it's not the simplest, right? Because there are a lot to envelop and enveloping this, this process. So I think it's not a bad thing. I wish we all go for it eventually, but we have to do it with caution with knowledge, knowing exactly why we are doing things. And I think also, in my opinion, this is the hardest because I don't believe we'll be able to really replicate everything. And that may be a bold statement, but that's my opinion. And I think it's also the, the question of which elements to add, because at the moment we don't know exactly where's the threshold, where is this, this barrier between this is essential, this is superfluous, right? I think it's also the process of trying to understand, but I think this understanding only comes from trying. And I think there's a lot of trial and error involved. Hopefully with AI, maybe we get a bit more insight and we can expedite the process but we still have to understand which key concepts we need to preserve for each of these models. And I think it will be quite, um, quite specific for the model, but also for the application itself. I fully agree there, and particularly also with what you say in the end, that uh, like whatever model we design or whatever we include, it should be driven by what is the application and what is the question we are trying to answer. I, sort of triggered also by what you said earlier. Right? Like if you think about complexity, it basically also deals with uh, adding multiple elements, more and more elements that in the end also interact and interfere with each other in unpredictable and nonlinear ways. And this is also indeed what, uh, when I talked about complexity in, in that paper that you quote in, in the end of your thesis, that's also indeed what I uh, talk about. That, that is undesired in the sense, of course, that, yeah, it means that it's less controlled uh, and that leads in the end to a lot of variation uh, and that variation cannot always be explained or systematically isolated anymore. And um, in that light, I 
think, and that that's uh, is something I would like to discuss is if you look at that, let's say the paper that the quote came from, uh, the title of that paper is uh, Orbiton Chips Breaking the In Vitro Impasse. So what the, the statement at least I make there uh, together with Professor van der Berg is that uh, with organs on chips, with this, let's say, and maybe more broadly with bioengineering in general, and so also the work, all the work that you have done here with in, yeah, uh, engineering a microenvironment for the cells, um, we actually now have a way forward then in, in which we can actually say, okay, the models are still controlled, but we can add complexity in an engineering way. And since we are engineering, yeah, we are in full control, whether what kind of curvature do we add, uh, what is the porosity that we add, et cetera. So uh, I optimistically see or saw a way out there saying- Professor like now, Van der Meer, can you hear me? Oh. Uh, can yeah, you, can, can hear you me. just wrap <laughs> up uh, and, and I go to yeah, your sure. last question Sorry. if uh, this was indeed a reasoning going to a last question. Thank you. No, no problem. Thank you, Mr. Prorective. So, but I, I wonder there in particular uh, whether you would agree because you say also adding the complexity, for example, of the curved membrane is already leading to so many uh, aspects that are, yeah, completely uh, unpredictable. So, am I being too optimistic? Maybe that is the brief version of my question. Maybe brief answer. Well, I think we should be optimistic, right? Otherwise, we don't move forward. I think bioengineering is here to address these questions. We just have to be cautious in the way we do it. But indeed, we should go element by element, trying to reduce the unpredictability of introducing these elements into the system. But I think, yes, I think we should all be positive about it. I, I'm very happy at least that you share this optimism. Thanks, uh, dear candidate. And I uh, happily give the word back to Mr. Prorector. Thank you. Thank you, Professor van der Meer, for uh, the very uh, nice dialogue uh, with the candidate. Uh, we move then uh, uh, to the next opponent, uh, Dr. Nicolas Kurniagan uh, from uh, um, University, Technology University of Eindhoven at the Department of Biomedical Engineering. Dr. Kurniagan is an expert in cell matrix mechanobiology. Um, thank you, uh, Mr. Prorector, and dear candidate. Um, I would like to uh, congratulate you again for the beautiful thesis. I, I enjoy very much reading it. Um, you know, over the years, uh, the, the topic that is, the topics that are um, discussed in the thesis are topics that are really close to my heart. So it's a, it's a, it's a great joy to, to actually uh, read um, a, a beautiful work that is uh, sort of uh, touching a lot into what I'm actually doing uh, myself. Um, you know, I, I find myself also like citing your papers and you know showing your figures when I'm presenting. So it's, which is a, a compliment to yourself and also to the um, supervisory team. Um, well, having said that, uh, um, there's one proposition that I think really triggers me, which is proposition number nine, and I would like to make your <laughs> paradigms busy again <laughs> by reading proposition number nine. Well, maybe I can say, esteemed opponent, thank you so much for your kind words, and I'm really happy to have you here in my committee. Proposition number nine. The comparison between the process and state of epithelialization of curved and flat cell culture substrates has an intrinsic bias. Yeah, so the question is, uh, what do you mean by an intrinsic bias, and what is the source of this bias? Yeah, so to address this, I will go back to explaining how we culture these cells on these curved surfaces. We start from the, the beginning where we just edit the cells on top and we let them fall by gravity. And what I just mentioned before, eventually they will fall more inside the microcavity. So then we have already a bias there because we have these cells mainly residing inside the cavities and then they have to populate the rest of the membrane. In this sense, if you want to see how, so how cells explore and, and experience the curvature, maybe we should have them everywhere, right? Because if they are at the very bottom and they have to climb up, it will be different, right? And then we also have this inflection point which introduces another type of curvature because let's be honest, we have a corner but also yeah. a bit convex. So this is also our bias in the so, system. Uh, sorry for interrupting, but uh, would you call that intrinsic bias or is it more experimental artifact or imperfections? 
Hmm, that's a very good point. Maybe you are right. Maybe it's not intrinsic to the, to the system, but more of the protocol or the methods that we use. Because we know, for example, for tubular, tubular structures, we always do this rocking motion to distribute the cells, right? And there we don't call it an in intrinsic bias. So I think you are correct. Maybe it's the handling of the, the system. Now I must say that I don't know how we could really solve it because we one could think of trying to implement something similar but if we put it on a rocker or if we try to rotate it i think well i don't know exactly how this will be perhaps we can better distribute the cells i think but also from the approach itself what i was trying always to do is when we see it we really go over the entire surface trying to overcome this process bias yes so still on this uh, on the topic of biases or imperfections. So you try to address one of those imperfections or biases in chapter five by doing these correction factors, right? So um, you take um, images, three-dimensional images with confocal, and then uh, realizing that you know, the analysis, uh, analysis of three-dimensional image to get cell morphologies is actually intrinsically imperfect or, or biased and you did something like a correction factor to correct for that. Now, of course, um, uh, you compare that also to what is uh, you know, more analytical um, correction. And I'm just wondering um, why choose one over the other, um, especially because if you think about what causes the, the bias or the incorrectness, it's probably the height, right? So the, where, uh, it, where the, the, uh, the location of the cells within this uh, micro wells, they're uh, at, not at different height positions. And that is what is causing the exactly. incorrect, incorrectness, right? Um, so why do you choose this correction factor and not the analytical correction? Well, that's, that's a very good point indeed. So we chose one approach, right? You have many others. For us, it was important to try to compensate for this distortion. And we found, we encountered this paper where they were doing it for, for these tubular structures. And the reality is we wanted to correct it since the very beginning, but in a user-friendly way, right? Because if we come up with a very analytical process, nobody will stick to it. Yeah. So we found this script that we can easily manipulate. We just have to define the, the dimensions and the structure, and it does the job, it gives you an answer. It's not the, the correct, it's not the perfect answer, but it was one of the approaches we found. And indeed, also the limitation of this particular script is that it kind of eliminates the, the uppermost cells because they get diffused when we stretch it mm. over the, and then we lose the ones that we wanted to investigate the most because those are the ones that we can't really access when we image. Those are the really hard ones to, to observe and to quantify. It was one approach, but indeed, it's not, it's not enough to really have a proper correction of this curvature. So what I understand is you have basically one correction factor per uh, morphological parameter, right? So it doesn't really matter on which kind of structure it is. You have one correction factor. Is that correct? I mean, I would imagine that the correction factor would be different for different kind of structures, right? Yes. Um, I would have to think, but... If you think from, and if you start from the mathematical point of view, it's all about stretching over bigger mm. surfaces, right? So then I think, but then I'm not 100% sure, I think mathematically it will work, but I would need to test it a bit more. I'm not mm. super confident, but yes. I think from okay. the mathematical point of view, you are just stretching over differently shaped surfaces, so. Yeah, okay. Um, then I would like to move to um, chapter six, where you use the micro well arrays to, to culture organoids, which is very, very interesting. Um, so I'm, I'm wondering, um, you know, w when you do this culture of organoids in micro wells, you have multiple factors at play, right? So you have the geometry, the curvature itself. Um, you, you discuss in the, in the chapter about the, the ability of cells to adhere or not. So cell uh, adhesion is, is also there. You talk about confinement, so confinement of organoids within this uh, confining micro wells. Um, uh, Professor Rosaldo Palmeyer also mentioned about material properties. So also you vary the percentage of BME. 
So a lot of things are going on at the same time. So what do you think are the, the balance between all these contributions? And uh, which are the most important? Which are you know, negligible for the purposes of your work? Can you comment a bit on that? Yes, thank you for this question again. Indeed, we have a lot going on. Um, from the BME perspective, what we notice is that we want to dilute it, but to a certain level where these organoids can still form. And this we could clearly see. If you don't have the right percentage, they will not form, they will not aggregate. So this was something that we had to play with and also make it in a way that it suits the platform. Because if we go with a lot of, or a high percentage of BME, these organoids, they will not sink and experience the confinement, the curvature. So we had to tweak the system in order to make them in the right environment in, ter in terms of growth factors and signals, but also in terms of the, the, the process itself, because they, they had to be able to sink and stay within these, these, these micro cavities. Um, in terms of uh, surface, we have a process, surface and the roughness of this surface, we have a process that doesn't really add a roughness to this. So I think in my opinion, and this is, is also has been reported before, we don't really have this surface playing a role. Then if you want, you can also make these systems porous if you want to exclude these confinements or gradients that possibly form inside. Um, and in terms of cavity itself, it plays the role to... You may finish your answer if you wish. So indeed we have a lot of, of pet parameters playing in this environment. And I think at the end we found a way to combine them and still have viable organoids with the right uh, subpopulations. So of course we have to further explore the impact of each of them, but at the end of the, the day it works. Thank you for the answer, and I will give the, the word back to Mr. Prorector. Thank you. Daniel Ferreira Battista. The time appointed for defending your thesis has passed. The degree committee will now withdraw to discuss the quality of your thesis and your defense. I request that you and your company await the results of our deliberations and our return in this room. The degree committee will debate the candidate's performance behind closed doors. This process usually takes about 10 minutes. is tied long road i don't waste no time break rules because fate decides with the team and we chase the light i make a move fall down shake it off i hate to lose that branch break it off no room for negativity praise and love prepare for deep park because we're taking off Take the mileage, 
Stefan Gieselbrecht, who is technologies of creating porous membrane-based 3D uh, cell culture substrates, played an important role in your project, and who can unfortunately not join us in person today because of illness, and Nilofar Tamashebi, who helped a lot with the daily supervision. I would also like to thank the external collaborators, Professor Himstra, Dr. Van Riet, Professor Roti, Professor Stamatsialis, Dr. Port, and Dr. Passmann, and the internal ones, especially uh, Dr. Reinhardt from Maastricht University and Dr. Moria Teixeira Leiten from Maastricht University at that time, now University of Twente. I would also like to thank the members of the assessment committee, its chair, Professor Van Grinsvan, and the other members, Professor Rosado Balmajor, Professor Van der Meer, and uh, Dr. Kornjuan for the critical reviewing of the thesis, writing the reports, willingness to prepare and join these defense, and for interesting scientific discussions during the same. And the pro-rector of this defense, Professor Moroni, for chairing it. I would, of course, like to congratulate also your, Danielle, your family, obviously, watching us from home. And I would like to thank the Paranus. Last but not least, I would like to thank the funders of your project, particularly Lung Foundation Netherlands and the province Limburg. Now, along the lines of your thesis, and there the part talking about exploring the respiratory landscape during your PhD, you climbed some mountains and traveled through some valleys in between. I'm happy that I've been part of this journey. I met you the first time when after an engineering uh, inquiry of a supervisor of your studies at the University of Lisbon, Hugo Ferreira, you joined our department of tissue regeneration at University of Twente at that time. There with Lorenzo Moroni, me and Hongling Chen, you conducted your master thesis project on tailoring crimp patterns on electron fibers by using thermal shrinkage to create mimetics of collagen architectures in various tissues. After having climbed that mountain, later also rewarded with a second authorship on a corresponding research paper in an RSC journal, Nanoscale, you have looked out for even higher mountains. You rejoined us, the former people from University of Twente, now at the Merlin Institute of Maastricht University for a PhD within the project Microengineered 3D Analogs of Alveolar Tissue for Lung Regeneration. Even if in these early days of the Institute, not every equipment and process was immediately available, you found your way into the first experiments. With your lively and proactive manner, you also quickly integrated into the growing groups of Stefan and me and the Institute. As near, scale, uh, near cell scale curvature could be assumed to be an important topographical feature when designing culture substrates mimicking the acinar alveolar sac and also the tubular respiratory and terminal bronchi of the human lung, you wrote your first paper, a review paper, on the possibly overlooked or underestimated effects of substrate curvature on cell behavior. This paper, published in Trends in Biotech, has been very well received by the relevant scientific community resulting in, meanwhile, more than 100 citations within around four years. Then your first research paper uh, and chapter, the paper published in the Journal of Biomaterials, was then on a 3D alveolar in vitro model based on epithelialized biomedically curved culture membranes. There, even if proving the effect of curved culture substrates on cells is generally challenging, you could demonstrate and critically discuss the methodology and workflow of the bio-inspired design, including deconstruction and simplification of its much more complex counterpart in vivo, the microfabrication of the subset and the epithelialization of the same and suitable ways of its biological characterization. Then your second research chapter and paper uh, published in ACS Biomaterial Science and Engineering on the 3D lung on a chip, um, on, again on a biometrically microcurved culture membrane showed your capacity of quickly implementing concepts from the desk at that time in the lab, also against the challenges of microfluidic cell culture in general, like bubbles, leakage and so on, and especially air liquid interface culture. Your third research chapter on restoring multi-scale curved geometry of the human bronchioles in a biomimetic 3D in vitro models based again on microcurved culture membranes was a logical consequence of the first two 
And apart from switching from Asena to tubular models, it also introduced variations of the scale. And your fourth and final research chapter and paper in the uh, journal Materials Today Bio on a polymer film based microarray platform for long term culture and research of young bronchial organids, inspired by Stefan Gieselbrecht's group, was a nice initiative of yours towards a fruitful collaboration with Nika Reynard from Pulmonology, Respiratory Medicine at UM. The manuscript was held through the revisions by Robert Rodier's team at Erasmus Medical Center, for which I'm very grateful. Concerning the new culture technology applied, there seems to be potential for more future research. Now, apart from your own research, you also contributed to a number of students with their internships and thesis projects and contributed to three more papers with the external collaborators and two more with internal ones with microbiomimetism and inspiration um, as a recurrent theme in these works. Generally, one of the things that sets you apart is your inspiration and creativity evidenced not only by the pop art cover of your thesis. Another related talent of yours is science communication to the professional audience or the general public. For example, during your inspiring presentation at the 29th Annual Conference of the European Society for Biomaterials, for which you have been awarded with the Presentation Award, or your presentation during the Limburg Investert in our Guinness Economy closing event. Now, supporting by your precision-loving German supervisor who has sent you chain emails with extensive list of questions and inquiries for corrections in conjunction with manuscript, typically around midnight, you wrote one review and four original research chapters and finally a fourth thesis. Today, you climbed the last part of another mountain peak, and I'm happy to witness this moment with you. With your position at Hub Orgonets, you're already setting off for new heights for which I wish you all the best, also generally for your professional and private life. But now, staying with the theme of your thesis, breathe in the mountain air and enjoy the view from this peak and towards a bright future and celebrate this memorable moment with your beloved ones. And with that, I give the word back to the Prorector. Thank you, Professor Turkenmuller. Dear Dr. Ferreira Baptista, also on behalf of the Uni Master's University, I congratulate you with this uh, degree that you have acquired. And let me also add a personal note. I have seen you indeed for many, many years. Uh, in the time of Twente University, you came as a master's, as a master's student and you did so, such a fantastic job. It's such a nice pleasure also for me to see the end of your research journey, at least with us, and I wish you also all the best in your professional and uh, private life. Uh, before I conclude this uh, um, uh, open uh, ceremony, let me uh, also give you a couple of little house rules. Um, we will actually stay here in the room now, right after I will use my tool to close the um, ceremony uh, and actually have the time for uh, uh, Professor van der Meer to also congratulate uh, the new doctor. We will have a, a picture here, so be, please be patient with us. And then as we walk uh, um, out of the room, we will actually go to the stairs in the main uh, hall. Uh, we will also have a, uh, another picture moment uh, uh, with the new doctor uh, and the paranyms and, and again, members of the family and, and, and loved ones in the, in the room uh, there. And then just next to the uh, stairs, there is a um, uh, sort of little museum uh, that we will uh, use as a space to congratulate the doctor. We are so sorry for you, but also that you will have to be patient a little bit because we will go first and then, of course, you can uh, come next. Uh, and uh, with this, I close this ceremony. Thank you. Thank you.